Hello, and welcome to Homegrown KC, a podcast dedicated to exploring Kansas City's fascinating history and sharing stories from its rich past. I'm your host, Laura. Join me today as we explore a piece of Kansas City's history. Welcome back, listeners. Can you believe it's the end of November? If you live in America, I hope you all have, or if you are listening to this afterwards, had a great Thanksgiving. Um, I know it's a truly awful origin, and no, it's not the, oh, the nice natives gave us poor white foreigners food and we were besties forever. Yay! It's not that story that they feed you in elementary school, but I think for most of us, the modern version of the holiday is more about food, family, and friends. So I hope you spent quality time with family and friends and you ate some really great food. Don't forget to get a booster shot if you've not already done so. If you have health issues or you just got the J&J one shot, I would highly encourage it. And in other good news, the FDA, sorry, FDA and the CDC have both approved vaccines for anyone over five. And there's now even an antiviral pill. So if you get sick, you can take this and it helps you get better faster. You won't, it's not a vaccine. It won't keep you from getting sick, but it's like a mucinex or or Tylenol. It just improves your systems, which I think is amazing. It's great stuff coming out of the science and medical field right now. And on a less exciting note, a white supremacist was recently declared innocent of all charges, even though he's on video has killing two people at a protest in 2020. Uh, For the families of those lost, I am so sorry you didn't receive the justice you deserve. But let's get down to business. This is topic three, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, part five of series four, Treasures of Kansas City. If this is your first time listening, then welcome. So glad you joined us. Please pause here, go back and listen to parts one, two, three, and four before this episode. It'll all help it make it much more sense. And then after this episode, I hope you all will also go back and listen to the first and second topics of this series, which are the Western Auto Building and the Country Club Plaza. All right, so recap. Part one, I had a biographical introduction for Mary Atkins and the Nelson family for whom the museum is named. Part two was all about how the estates finally came together and how a plan for the museum was created. Part three was a... um, Detailed analysis of the architecture and symbolism of various elements. And then in the last episode, I gave you biographies of some of the first men involved in the museum, particularly Lawrence Sickman and Paul Gardner. And I talked about the monuments men because we had a lot of people involved in the museum who were also monuments men. And it's amazing. So we're going to pick up our story right where we left off in 1941. It's not the start of World War II, but it's when America became involved. And you'll remember from the previous episode that Lawrence Sickman, the creator of Asian Art, and Paul Gardner, the director of the Nelson Gallery, uh, sorry, Gallery, um, they're both, like, super famous in their field and just amazing. And they're over in Europe being heroes, saving the world and whatnot. That means that there's nobody at the Nelson So who's going to fill in the spot? It's the women. Yes, got some awesome women coming up for y'all. The Nelson Atkins Museum would absolutely not be what it is today without these women. Quote, given the small staff of the museum in its early days, each employee wore a variety of hats, especially the women. In addition to Ethelene Jackson and Lindsay Hughes, other first-generation female staffers included Frances O'Donnell, Louise Nelson, Jane Rosenthal, Francis Webb, Mary Louise Clifton, Louise Lebrick. Sorry, I'm not sure if I said that right. All of these women took on multiple roles during their time at the museum, largely focused in the education department, commonly seen as the domain of women. They were also responsible for programming, label writing, and research, end quote. So before I dig into these fabulous ladies, I actually have another tidbit for you that I found really interesting, but I couldn't figure out where else to put it, so we're going to sneak it in here. In 1941, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, 
Gardner made the executive decision to move all Japanese art on display and put it in storage because he was afraid that people would come to the museum and vandalize it. And it was two years before anybody noticed, or at least until anybody said anything. But honestly, that was super, super smart of him. I mean, anyways, um, back on target. So just, they're away, saving the world, saving art. And we have Miss Ethelene Jackson in the house. Ooh, Miss Jackson, I am for real. Gardner hired Ethel in 1933 as his secretary because his previous secretary was about to get married. And, you know, it was really not common for a married woman to work outside the homes in the 30s. So before going to work for him, Ethel was the secretary for Mr. Volker, who was one of the estate trustees. Quote, as director Paul Gardner's executive assistant, she oversaw the American wing, was curator of decorative arts, and lectured at the museum and the Kansas City Art Institute. End quote. And so, like I said, with Gardner off, she becomes acting director, which is huge. It was an excellent fit for her because she'd studied art at KU. She knew a lot about art history. Quote, Jackson oversaw a much reduced, largely female staff. Under her leadership, they put into practice the belief that the museum played an important role in keeping up civilian morale. They maintained regular museum activities, introduced new programming, and hosted dances for members. End quote. As acting director, she advised the trustees, especially Nichols. Uh, he was still around then. Sounds like they had a really close working relationship, which I think is cool. Um, she continued to assist the museum and the trustees in art acquisitions. And she oversaw the final sales of Laura Kirkwood's estate and even saved some of Kirkwood's art for the museum, more than had been originally picked out. She was the first and so far only woman to be director of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And naturally, as a woman, she was paid less than her predecessor. But man, she had some serious grit. She repeatedly petitioned the board for higher pay. She had actually been making more as secretary under Garner than she was as acting director, and that's some BS. Eventually, uh, they did give her a pay raise. But it was still way less than the pay raise that they gave Sigmund and Gardner, who were both still employed for the museum, even though they were in Europe. Likewise, Sigmund's secretary played a major role in the early days of the museum. So in 1933, the trustees hired Lindsay Hughes to be his secretary. She was born Ruth Lindsay Hughes on September 8, 1908 in Bevier, Missouri attended the University of Missouri and graduated with her BA in 1931 and then started working for the museum two years later. So when she first started, she and her co-worker Frankie Askew repaired a Prussian rug, dusted pottery, polished andirons, and cleaned chandeliers. But she eventually convinced Garner to let her write good um, guidebooks for some of the rooms and give lectures. Um, she even convinced him to let her develop a radio program to dramatize the collection, which is pretty cool. I don't know of anything like that today. After Sigmund was named curator in 35, she became his assistant. And then when he left for Europe, she took over as curator of Asian art. Quote, during her tenure, she built up the Persian art collection and organized a special Chinese fair exhibit to raise money for Chinese war orphans. She also received a leave of absence to study at the University of Chicago in 1945 and 1946 on a competitive fellowship sponsored by the Chinese government, end quote. Now, I mentioned Frances O'Donnell at the end of the last episode. Actually, at the end of episode three, sorry. Um, and I promised to tell you all more about her and didn't have time. Um, but that worked out really well because it's so much better to fit her in here with these other badass women. Also in part three, I talked about the things that make the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art really unique in the art museum world, especially when they first opened. And one of them was their emphasis on education. Uh, Gardner had championed the education department and originally he was the one delivering weekly lectures um, Wednesday nights to adults. But then in 1934, so just a year, actually, since they opened in December, you know, less than a year after they opened, they hired Frances O'Donnell um, to direct the education department. 
So she worked at the museum from 34 to 39. Um, she attended Barnard College in New York and then spent two years working at the Buffalo Museum of Science before moving to Kansas City. According to Wolferman, she actually applied to work at the Nelson in 31 and again in 33, but they wouldn't hire her until she had completed a, a, a degree in museum science, which she managed to do in 34. I'm, so based on all of that, I'm guessing that she graduated from Barnard in 30 or 31. She, quote, developed tours of sculpture, painting, tapestry, and glass and pottery, end quote. Her volunteer docent training program was so good that the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York modeled their docent program on what she was doing here in Kansas City. How kick-ass is that? So the way that the this docent program got started, this is a cool story. She was at a dinner, and this chick next to her, they're chatting each other up, right? And she's like, hey, I work for the Junior League, or uh, I volunteer for the Junior League, sorry. And you know what? I think we would be really interested in helping the museum. And O'Donnell's like, yeah, you would. I would love to have you. So they hook up, and members of the Junior League became the Dawsons. They volunteered at the museum. They trained for eight hours a day for two weeks before they gave their first tour. Um, O'Donnell also researched and wrote little guidebooks for the kids and gave them out to the teachers three weeks in advance before they came to a tour. So this thing, man, they had it so structured and organized. Everybody was so dedicated. That That's a lot of work to put in. O'Donnell also oversaw the creation of art classes for children beginning in the summer of 1935. And then having done all of this, she announces in 1939 that she's leaving because she's going to get married. But who could possibly fill her shoes? She's done so much. Well, the answer, of course, is the assistant, Miss Louise Nelson. The board agreed, and they paid for her to take a two-month tour of Europe to study art before she began as the education director. Her assistants were Frances Webb and Mary Louise Clifton. So educational programming kept growing and growing, and in 1940, Louise Nelson is like, I need money, and I need people, and I need it now. Wolferman, uh, Christy Wolferman didn't say in her book whether or not the board agreed, but I like to think that they were like, yeah, you're doing a lot. You need that. But then the next year, we joined World War II, and so everything fell by the wayside. Um, in fact, Nelson... Uh, Louise Nelson, who had just taken over as the education department, she left the museum to join the Red Cross, as did her assistant, Frances Webb. Um, and she never returned to her position at the museum after the end of the war. A few years later, she married Robert Lung. Uh, sorry, Long, Robert Long. Um, and funny enough, he was the son of John C. Long, who was a contractor for the Nelson Atkins Museum. So um, while Nelson and Webb were with the Red Cross, her other assistant, Mary Louise Clifton, had taken over as director of education. And I know there's a lot of turnaround, but everybody's doing so much good work. But then when Gardner and Sickman came home, the museum was like, sorry, new phone, who this? <laughs> or more accurately, as Kristen Wolferman said, the various programs that Jackson and Nichols had instituted to attract visitors had become services the public liked and expected to continue. Gardner lamented that, quote, the interest in art per se is not as great as it could be, end quote, end quote. So sadly, Jackson did resign in 1946. He had met and was going to marry Jermaine uh, Sigelman. I think I'm saying that right. He was an art dealer from New York. Lindsay also left a few months later to marry Frank Cooper. Um, they both moved to New York, so I like to think that they remained friends and they hung out regularly. Jackson worked in her husband's art gallery and published articles on art. She died in 1993. Meanwhile, um, meanwhile, excuse me, Lindsay did find a job working as an Asian art dealer, uh, which is super cool. And then because of that, she and Frank ended up moving to California and then later to Iran, all because of the work she was doing. And when she was in Iran, she taught ESL, English, English as a second language. Lindsay and Frank moved back to Kansas City in 1970 or 1971. 
According to Wolferman, she returned to the museum as, quote, a lecturer and special assistant to the director of the museum, end quote. Lindsay Hughes Cooper died on November 16, 1997, at the age of 89. So post-World War II, everyone at the museum is ready to return to normal life. That sounds familiar. So even though, you know, we're full steam ahead under Jackson, O'Donnell, Hughes, and all the other boss ladies... After the war, during the 50s, during the latter half of the 40s, really, um, and then into the 50s, they really pick up steam. So in 1948, the museum hired the Long Construction Company, that's uh, John Long that I mentioned earlier, to install a Gothic cloister from a chapel near Beauvoir, France, as well as, quote, another classical gallery, a medieval sculpture gallery, a Spanish Baroque chapel, an English Tudor room, a French 17th century room, and a Venetian 18th century alcove, end quote. So those of you who have visited the Nelson Atkins, and man, if you haven't and you've been listening to this episode, please come to Kansas City and go to this museum. Um, but if you've been to the museum, you know what the cloister is. When I say that, you can visualize it. It's Art museums, to me, have this sense of sacredness to them like you walk in and you can just you can feel like the sense of peace and calm but when you step into this cloister like it's so much stronger it's almost like all of the prayers and worship that took place in it while it was in France were imbued into the stone and now it's just gently radiating it out if you remember way back to part two and three, um, I told you that the first floor of the museum had been left unfinished for future expansion. Well, construction was finally finished in 1949. 1958 was probably the highlight of the decade for the museum because it was their 25th anniversary, but there were a lot of big things that happened in the 50s besides that. In 1952, Gardner renounced to, announced his retirement as museum director, so Lawrence Sickman took over as director in May of 1953. And even though he was director, he also continued to work as the curator of Asian art. That's a lot of work told to two big jobs like that. It's got to be so stressful, but he did it. Um, 54 was really, really a big year. So they hired Kella, Kelleher. Keller? It's uh, K-E-L-L-E-H-E-R. Let's go with Kelleher. Um, as the curator of European art in 54, uh, he really beefed up our collection of medieval European paintings. Um, and you will hopefully remember him from the previous episode. He was a monuments man. Outreach and events, as it would be called today, really expanded. The first jewel ball was held at the museum in 54. And it, from the way that Christy was talking about it, it sounded like a lot of the um, upper staff at the museum didn't want it. But then the society of matrons just planned everything anyways. Um, the museum did not receive any additional profit, but they were reimbursed, uh, reimbursed for the hosting expenses. And afterwards, everyone who had been so against it was like, oh yeah, that's great, let's do it again next year. And this became an annual event. Eventually, the museum uh, even started earning half of the ticket sales. Also in 1954, the university trustees created the Nelson Gallery Foundation so that they could have more spending leeway. Money is going to be a big issue in the next episode. Just prepare yourself. So the museum expanded its photography collection in the 1950s. Christie stated that, quote, Although the museum had recognized photography as an art form almost from the beginning, the concept of collecting photographs was innovative for a general historical museum, end quote. Today, they have an obviously fabulous collection, which I'm sure we'll um, touch on in maybe not the next episode, but the one after. I know, spoilers. Um, but y'all, in 1958, they purchased 173 photographs from Kansas City native photographer David Douglas Duncan, and what's so cool about these photographs is they all feature the one and only the Pablo Picasso. How cool is that? Apparently they're really good friends. 
That's where we're going to end our story for the day. Thank you for joining me as we continue to explore the history of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. For sources, my main source has been and will continue to be the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, A History by Christy Wolferman. And I always feel like I'm saying Hogwarts, A History, when I read out that whole title. Anyways, it's fabulous. You guys will love it. I highly recommend it. Other sources include a news article by KNBC, PendergastKC.org, KCKHistory.org, and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art Archives. For merchandise, visit Zazzle, that's Z-A-Z-Z-L-E dot com, slash store, slash homegrown, underscore, KC, underscore store, to see what's available. There are some new items, um, a couple of hoodies, and a Christmas tree ornament. It's so cute. Make sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. I'm Homegrown KC on all of them. Also, make sure to rate and review me on Apple Podcasts. The more ratings and reviews I get, the higher up in the charts I go, and the easier it'll be for other people to find me. You can visit my website for additional information. That's homegrownkc.wordpress.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or episode suggestions, or you just want to talk Kansas City history, you can email me at homegrownkcpodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, you can now subscribe to the show and listen to each episode on Facebook, so check that out. It's really cool. You can also check me out on Audia. It's a new audio-based platform. Create a profile, search Homegrown KC, follow the show. You can see all the episodes there. I hope you will consider becoming a monetary supporter of the show if you can. You can do so by subscribing to patreon.com slash homegrownkc or redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. For $5 a month, you'll get charged on the first of it. every month. You get a item from the merchandise store valued at $5 or less. A shout out on each episode. So thank you Bjorn and Joan for your continued support. Love you. And you get access to exclusive bonus content. This is the part you guys are going to want the most. Um, once in a while, I'll give you a little preview of what some of that is. For example, the current episode, which is available, is the uh, Riger Distillery. I spoke with Ryan Maybe, who's the co-founder of the Revived Distillery. We touched on so many things on that. It's a really great episode. I think you guys will love it if you haven't already listened to it. But that is a Patreon episode, and it is only available to the public for a limited time. Um, so it's available until December 31st. On January 1st, it's going to become Patreon exclusive only, so listen to it while you can. And if you enjoy it, go back and listen to my Paris of the Plains series. That series features Prohibition, the Pendergast Saga, and Madam Annie Chambers. For today's final announcement, I don't remember if I said so at the end of the previous episode or not, but I have decided to once again remove Union Station from the series. I know, I know, I've been promising it for a long time, I'm so sorry. There's just no way it's going to get done before the end of the year, obviously. Um, so that will be a future series. And I'll go ahead and let you know now, based on the rate at which we are currently going... Um, they, we have 70 years of history left and, um, it, we're doing like two decades at a time. So I think I really have like two episodes left, the sixties and seventies and then the eighties and nineties and then the, um, two thousands to 2020. That is two, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> that's just for a heads up for y'all. So Thank you goes out to my talented sister-in-law, Sarah McCombs, who created my logo, to the Dear Misses for the use of their song Kansas City as the intro and outro music of the show, to local libraries, which enabled me to gather all my research, and to you, wonderful listeners. Thanks for listening. Cheers.
had to ask you this tonight Cause I can't seem to shake this feeling And I can't seem to get you off my mind 